We're looking at the NBA Cup schedule and a whole lot of Jason Tatum reaction to the Olympics questions in the mailbag. Let's get to it right now on the Locked On Celtics podcast. Thanks for blockbuster bread. It's holiday season. Drop Drew in the mix. And three from KT. No, we not on the Knicks. Flushing competition like Al on Giannis. Juice and Big Zeus still being town's finest. Been a race team going up in the rafters. Watch the seeds game in locked on after. Corrales on the breakdown. Clutch like a tip from D. White on the breakdown. John on the mic document and domination. Matter pen of back bay. It's all seeds nation. Rain and Jake. How we started raising business. How we finish. Locked on. Hey there, welcome back to the Lockdown Celtics Podcast, right here on the Lockdown Podcast Network. It's your team every day, and I got you Monday, Wednesday, and Friday for the rest of August and most of September. So in a few weeks, when camp opens back up and the season starts back up, like that's soon, I will be back with five days a week. More podcasts than you're going to find anywhere else. Uh, so make sure you're subscribed if you're, you know, however you want to listen to it. If you're on YouTube, you can watch the show on YouTube. You can get to the comment section. Let me know what you're thinking about everything that I'm saying. You can help me answer the questions in the, in, in the, uh, comment section, however you want to do it. Uh, I'm John Corrales, by the way, if you're new to the show, you don't know me. Uh, I used to play a long time ago. Now I'm covering the Celtics as a beat writer for Boston sports journal. I've also written two Celtics books. The latest one is Built Different, commemorating the Celtics' 18th banner. So go pick that one up. Uh, I'll be selling them very soon. Signed copies on my website. So uh, be happy to have you there. Today's show, by the way, brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. This summer, FanDuel hooking up all customers with a booster bonus every single day. So there's something for everybody. Visit FanDuel.com to get started. Later on, we'll get into some of the mailbag questions. Uh, but I want to start with the NBA Cup and the opening night schedule, which all of this stuff has been revealed. Celtics are going to get their their uh, rings and raise the banner against the New York Knicks on the 22nd. So that's really two months away. Think about that for a second. I'm recording this on August 13th. So next week is the 20th. Two months after that. So really, we're just about two months away from ring night, banner raising. That is going to be incredible. I feel like I just left the garden. I feel like I was there like a couple of weeks ago. And now we're right back to it. It's quick. It's a quick turnaround. So Celtics in the Knicks. And then the NBA Cup. It's the uh, November 12th at home against Atlanta. It's a Tuesday night. The next Tuesday night, the 19th, at home against Cleveland. That's on TNT. The following, uh, that next Friday, that very you know, few days later, at Washington. And then Friday the 29th, a week later, at Chicago. Atlanta, Cleveland, Washington, Chicago. So really one tough team, one okay team. The uh, Washington Wizards and Chicago Bulls are not okay. So Celtics have a chance to get through this group pretty easily, but you never know how it's going to go. The entire schedule has not been released, so we don't know if any of these is on a back-to-back. We, I don't know what the other circumstances are, so we don't know who's going to be available. But on the surface, Atlanta, Cleveland, Washington, Chicago seems like a pretty easy group, and the Celtics should probably come out of that. And then after that, so the the third, the fourth game is on the 29th. Then there's a quarterfinal game on Tuesday, the 10th of December, and Wednesday, the 11th. Then there are semifinals in Las Vegas on Saturday, December 14th. And then Tuesday, the finals, the championship, uh, uh, Tuesday, the 17th of December. That's the breakdown. Not going to get any deeper into it. That's... That's all it is. NBA Cup. Talked about it on Lockdown NBA. Extended discussion of the NBA Cup on Lockdown NBA with me and Jake Madison. So go check that out there. All right, let's get into the mailbag. Heavy, heavy mailbag questions about Jason Tatum in the Olympics, Jalen Brown in the Olympics. If you want to get a question in, johncorrales.com slash mailbag. It's the only way you're going to get a question in. 
I can't get them on YouTube. I'm not going to get them on uh, Twitter or anywhere else. This is the only way I can organize them. The, sorry, this is it. I'm an old man. This is the easiest thing for me. And I'm going to make it easy on myself. JohnCorrales.com slash mailbag. All right, let's get to the first question. Is two questions in one. Tom says, I hope the disrespect doesn't have the opposite effect. What are the chances that JB's series MVPs, Kerr's idiocy, uh, idiocy uh, caused JT to be more selfish? He's a worse player when he's forcing the matter. And then Drew says, was Tatum overlooked because he wasn't seen as an alpha anymore? Could this force Tatum to revert to type? Could this be Spur? I mean, Kerr and Spoh's master plan all along. He had an a uh, an LOL, Drew did. Not an AOL. That's an old internet company. He had an LOL, which is laugh out loud, which was a joke. So I'm off to a roaring start in this podcast. I'm I'm impressing myself with how old I sound on this podcast. So the question here is, I, I think a good one. Does Jason look at what happened, the reaction and say, well, if I'm not going to get the respect, then I am going to be selfish. And I don't think that that's the case. I think he might learn. Uh, he might try a couple of things where he, he is going to go more off on his own. I don't think that his attitude, overall attitude is going to change because he won an NBA championship playing the way he played. And he knows that if he reverts, then yeah, he can go back to maybe being a little bit more, uh, more consistent of a scorer, but what does that get him? That didn't get him a championship in the, in the past. He has an opportunity to be seen as a Celtics legend, like an absolute, no doubt legend. His number is probably going to be retired at this point anyway, but let's solidify that. Put your name in the in the conversation with Larry Bird uh, more than, hey, Larry had this record. Now Jason Tatum has tied him or passed him. Be in, be in that conversation when somebody like me who wrote that book, uh, the Boston Celtics All-Time All-Stars, when I go back in 15 years and maybe write uh, an addendum, it's, hey, Jason Tatum is right there with Larry Bird. So I'm going to start. Larry, and you're going to start like knocking people off. If you're doing 12 players, two at each position and two wild cards, Jason's going to start knocking people off. Does he knock Paul Pierce off a list? Like all of that stuff. If he wins two or three championships, especially if they're in a row. So I don't think he's going to revert. I don't think he's going to become more selfish. I think he might against the Warriors have a selfish game. I think he might try to uh, send a message to Steve Kerr or stare down Steve Kerr when he, you know, he, like he's going to have some extra motivation there. But I don't think he reverts to anything. Tatum knows where his success lies. And I just, I can't see him getting so caught up, especially with the teammates that he has and the coach that he has. I don't think he's going to, they're going to let him get that caught up. Robert says, John, I'm sure I'm at least the 87th person to mention Dave Vermill calling out Tatum for a quote, petulant whining about the team USA thing. I'll leave it at that. You have the mic, sir. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> So I heard Dave Ramil said this uh, kind of in passing on Locked On NBA. And I, I'll just say I didn't see or hear any petulant whining. And if I heard it, trust me, I would call it out. If Tatum was acting like a petulant jerk and whining about Team USA, I would I would do a whole show about that because that would be the single greatest threat to the Celtics winning another championship. I don't think that's what Tatum was doing. And maybe maybe you can say there was petulant whining from people outside of his sphere. Maybe some Celtics fans were whining about it. You can say, okay, some people went over the top of it. Okay, I, I can accept that. But Tatum's comments? No. 
Tatum's comments were fine. He didn't say anything throughout the course of the tournament. And then afterwards he was interviewed and it's a storyline. He was going to get asked about it. And he said, you know, it was, I think his comments were very above board, honest and not bad because he consistently said, it's not about me. We won the, we won the gold. That's what it's all about. It was tough. Sorry if you heard me just smash my mic. It was tough, but it's not about me. It, you know, I have my own personal stuff, but it's not, I don't want to make this about me. He said that like three, four times. So Tatum, petulant whining, absolutely not. And if, if that comment was about Tatum, then it's completely way off base. Uh, it's Tatum was, was honest. And frankly, if, if players are going to get called out every time they're honest, then we start to lose, we completely lose the leg to stand on when we say, why aren't players more open in interviews? So I think Tatum was open. I think he was honest. I think the comments were completely fine, above board, and not not even a hint of a threat to the Celtics. And trust me, I'm very open and keen to what threats are going to be out there. And if there's a Miami Heat fan, a Locked On Heat fan listening, yeah, this is a Celtics podcast, but I will repeat the thing that I've always said about my loyalties. My loyalty is to the game of basketball. And if I see a member of the Celtics acting in a way that hurts the basketball, then I will be the first person to call it out. Tatum did not do any of that. So uh, that puts that to rest. All right, let's get more questions. There are more questions, but then we'll also get into Derek White's contract and maybe a misconception about it. We'll talk about that next. Today's show was brought to you by FanDuel all summer long. FanDuel is giving everybody, new customers, regular customers, a boost or a bonus every single day. So there's something for everybody all summer long, even as sports wind down. The Olympics are gone. The WNBA is coming back, but it's a little slower, but you still get that boost. You still get that bonus every single day from FanDuel. The opening night NBA odds are out. Just talked about. The opening night, Celtics getting their rings against the uh, New York Knicks. The Celtics are five and a half point favorites in that game already. So uh, check it out. I know that ring night's a little tough for the the team that receives the rings. It's a uh, Brad Stevens was just talking about how it's not uh, a night that uh, they feel like the team might be ready right away. So. Who knows? So it's five and a half points. Go check it out on FanDuel.com and start making the most out of your summer. FanDuel is the official sports betting partner of Major League Baseball. Thank you for making Locked On Celtics your first listen. Every day, go check out Locked On NBA. Like I said before, Jake Madison and I talked a lot about the NBA Cup, some games that we thought that we were going to be interesting. And we also talked about Kevin Durant uh, mentioning the word retirement. So that's all on today's Locked On NBA. So go check that out. Make that your second listen. Back to the mailbag. And we'll get into Ed, who's just throwing this out there. The best Olympic redemption for JB and JT in 2028 would be to redeem the embarrassment that was our 3v3 basketball performance. Grab D. White. Run, cut through competition like a hot knife through butter. They would have a good shot at gold. And there's a few people who actually uh, suggested three on three. Unfortunately, like, first of all, that would be amazing. If they just took uh, Jalen, Jason, Derek White and said, go for it. That would be incredible. And it would be, it would just be fun to say three guys from one NBA team go and try to win gold. The problem is that, the that FIBA presents uh, some serious obstacles to NBA players. And if you heard Brian Windhorst talk about it, they don't want USA to be a lock for another basketball gold. They want three, three versus three on three to be an open, anybody can win competition and during the NBA season, there are three-on-three -three competitions that you have to participate in, and that's how you earn like points or whatever 
to get you qualified to be in the Olympics. So they've made it so NBA players cannot actually participate in those. And if you can't participate, you're not eligible to play. So while I agree, it'd be so fun to see those guys out there just dominating a three-on-three game. There's a reason why USA sent Jimmer Fredette and I don't know who else to go because those are the guys who could participate in those tournaments. Uh, and that, that eliminates a lot of guys, by the way. That eliminates all the G League players. That eliminates even like fringe NBA players like Peyton Pritchard can't do it. You can't even get Peyton Pritchard, Sam Hauser, and Luke Cornett out there. You know what I mean? He can't do anything. Like there, there's the parameters that they've set are very difficult. So that's that's FIBA for you. That they they understand that USA basketball is going to dominate. And who knows how long that's going to go? 2028. I don't know how heavy a favorite team USA is going to be. We'll cover that in a podcast four years from now or three and a half years from now. But the three on three, anybody, any guys, any fringe players, uh, anyone else that's not in the NBA, that's not in a basketball season can go and, and try to make the Olympic three, three on three team. So it's it sucks. I want to see like, yeah, I want to see USA win gold. Andrew says, I've been listening to your coverage, uh, has me thinking, would USA be better off fielding five stars and the rest role players? What would it look like if they took five all NBA guys and then the best sixth men in the league? I think that's, that's going to be kind of how it goes. Um, I I've said that I think I might've said in the last podcast, there's a, I think there's a four wing, like elite wing player for front court. So your four five slash players, maybe a couple of straight centers and four high level role players that you can mix and match, right? Groups of two, two, and one, two, you know, so, so you've got different groups that you can pick from. Okay. I'm going to pick from these two elite players. I'm going to pick from these two bigs or three elite players, one big and one role player that you can kind of mix and match those guys. But I think in a 12 person, uh, lineup, a roster having that mix of four, four and four or four, five and three, something, something in that, in that general vicinity, I keep hitting this microphone. I got to change this. Uh, sorry. Having a group like that is going to be the future of USA basketball. You can't just go 10 elite players and a couple of role players. It's not, it's not a formula that you, you're going to succeed with. You need guys that are very comfortable in those roles. So there's going to be, I mean, maybe Jason Tatum gets left off in 2028 because the, the, the elite players that they've picked are enough and Tatum doesn't fit that next group. Maybe he does. Maybe he doesn't. Maybe Jalen does or doesn't who knows, but the competition is so good. Now the competition has caught up to USA basketball pretty much. There's NBA players all over all of these rosters. Even South Sudan had fringe NBA guys, guys who have been in the league and could be in the league. So they're going to have to really consider roster construction and figuring out continuity roles. And that, that, that's all important. That, that's going to change how this team is built for sure. Josh says, I keep hearing how Derek white took a hometown discount. Uh, how come no one seems to mention that he could, regress. He could get hurt. If he was betting on himself, would he have felt good about taking uh, an Olympic opportunity? Don't get me wrong. I think it was a win-win deal, but if I was Derek White, I would want the guaranteed money. So that's the concept. The concept is that, that Derek White could have gone to free agency and 
gotten a bigger bag, as they say. Uh, but he chose instead to take the extension that was available now and leave, I don't know, was it 20, 20 million or so on the table? And everybody's saying, hey, great, great for him. Good for him. Now he's 30 years old. So I feel like getting that contract now is a hedge against what Josh is saying. That what if he does regress? I don't know that he regresses necessarily. I think he's he plays at a level where it's awesome to see, but it's not so great that there's uh, everybody's looking at, wow, this is going to be a regression to the mean somehow. I think he's just this good. But in the over the course of over the course of the next few years, I mean, thirty years old, you don't know how he's going to age. I expect him to age well, but when does he start to slow down? When does he stop being as athletic as he is? When does that start to cost him? He's not a huge guy. So if he loses a step, it's not like he can say, well, now I'm just going to go play a different position. He has to play one of the guard spots. He can't just say, I'm going to be a small forward and be a little bit bigger or a power forward or anything like that. Like Jason Tatum has the potential when he's 35 to put on a little extra weight or something and play a four or a five. He could just become, he could finish his career as a center, a stretch five. You know what I mean? Like there's a, there's a rebirth that's possible for Jason Tatum because of his size and his ability. And you say, well, he can't take anybody off the dribble or blah, blah, blah anymore, but he can play. He can play that poor Zingas role pretty well, right? At 35, 36, 40. There, there's a there's a way for him to extend his career. So Derek White, yeah, all of that stuff could happen. But he also plays a style, and he's been durable in Boston. He plays a style where I think with the not just how good he is, but salary caps increasing. There, there is more money. He he could have gotten more money. It was there for him, provided he didn't suffer a catastrophic injury. It was it would be there for him. Uh, so I do think that there was a little bit of a hometown discount. Uh, I do think that he did the Celtics a favor. I think he did want to stay in Boston and play for Joe Missoula, and I think he he just loves it here. So I do think all of that stuff came into play, but I'm not discounting all of the stuff that Josh just listed. Uh, we'll come back. We'll get into changing the MVP award in conversation. It's coming up in just a second. Again, mailbag questions can come in at johncorrales.com slash mailbag. Like John did, who said, can we all stop having disingenuous MVP conversations? Let's have top scorer and MVP awards. So, for example, Luca could win top scorer honors, but not likely MVP because that includes all the other metrics, so on and so forth. I like this idea. I think what you would have is three awards of somewhat equal weight your defensive player of the year is very NFL style. Your defensive player of the year, your offensive player of the year, and the MVP. And a lot of times, the offensive player of the year and the MVP are going to be the same, but it gives the voters an opportunity to say, well, let's just say, Steph Curry was the offensive player of the year, but Jason Tatum played better defense. And so we're going to vote Tatum the MVP, but Steph, because even though he scored more points, he was not quite the defender. He's the offensive player of the year. I think that's a great way to do it. Uh, I'm surprised the NBA doesn't have that. And I think part of the problem is 
they have defensive player of the year and MVP. They have one spe specific defensive player of the year. And that kind of says to the voters, well, the MVP is your offensive award, right? It's, it's to the biggest scorer. Now, the year Marcus Smart won Defensive Player of the Year, he was never going to be the MVP. Um, and even if you have uh, a guy like, not LeBron anymore, but LeBron at his, at his peak, or any of these guys at their peak that are also really good defenders, like Victor Wembanyama, he could be the Defensive Player of the Year and the MVP. Uh, and he could probably do it without being, being the leading scorer. He would just have to be like amazing at you know, his passing would be amazing and all this other stuff. But it's not it's not a a, a thing that you normally see. If you're going to be defensive player of the year and the MVP, it, you also have to be one hell of an offensive player. As opposed to I think in say the NFL, where and now look, I'm not NFL. I'm not very well versed. So I don't know how many defensive player of the year awards go to uh, like a most valuable player, but guys can be the most valuable player being a defensive star. And I, I just think that doesn't exist in the same way in the NBA. So I would love it if they created an offensive player of the year. Um, it just kind of makes sense. And I'm kind of surprised that they didn't do it. So um I would say that more so than top scorer. And let's finish with Chris, who did a little homework here. And it's not even a question, but I thought it was kind of cool. He used Jason Tatum's games played per season, minutes per game, points per game, and, <clears throat> excuse me, took the figures. He says, I've done some pretty cool math about Tatum's salary. If Jason Tatum maintains his averages he's had over the last three years, Here's a breakdown he will of what he will earn in fun categories. For every game he plays, he'll make $863,000. Just by every game he plays, that's 863k. Boom. That's incredible. Every minute on the floor, you can look at it that he's every minute is $25,000 a minute on the floor. So every minute that goes by, Think of it that way. Every minute, Jason Tatum starts the game, 12 on the clock. When 11 hits the clock, $25,000 has gone into his account. When it's 10, another, yeah, that is incredible. Um, the breakdowns can be just so much fun. Uh, $93,000 for every three-pointer he hits. I mean, if somebody wants to give me $93,000, I will I will get myself to a point where I will make NBA three pointer. I will start practicing now. I will stop my. Somebody wants to give me a call. Be like, hello, nine hundred and sixty three thousand. What was it? Ninety ninety three thousand dollars per three pointer. Yeah, I'm I'm in. I'm in. I just have to find a way to crash an NBA game. That's a different story. I don't think anybody's going to be signing a fifty one year old guy who's. Oh, we'll just say 50 pounds past his playing weight. And we're not going to double check that. Uh, but I love these breakdowns because it's just so much money. It's so much money. But th listen, these guys have earned this money because that's what's coming in. They get half of the money that's coming into the league and it's distributed. That half is distributed amongst every all the players. The owners get half. This money is coming in. We're not taking this money from teachers and, you know, firemen and all that stuff. The money is just what's coming in. So if they, if the players didn't get this money, it would just go to the owner's pockets. So yeah, it's ridiculous. These guys, Jason Tatum has the potential to gross a billion dollars, a billion with a B just from his NBA money. He has the potential to gross a billion dollars by the time his career is over, if he plays long enough, just in NBA money. Never mind the endorsements. Never mind the Jordan money and the. I mean, he's selling everything. God, he he endorses every. He's 
he is incredibly popular endorser. I am surprised that he is as popular as he is as an endorser, but man, he, he rakes it in. That dude is rich, rich. <laughs> so good for him. Good for him. The money's there. You know, I'd rather have it go to a player than in some already billion guys, guys who own the teams are already billionaires. Why do they need more money? You've, you're already billionaires. But these guys earn some money. Start giving it back to the community. That's that's why I like, you know, what Jalen's doing and all that stuff. All right, that's a mailbag. Thank you so much for everybody, uh, for tuning in, everybody. Um, really do appreciate you doing so. Uh, again, johncorrales.com slash mailbag to submit your questions. If you're not subscribed at this point, please do so wherever you get your podcast. You can listen however you want to listen. It's great for the car on the ride on the ride to work. Uh, you can, if you listen to something else, if you want to listen to Locked On NBA on your ride to work, pop this video on in the background at work and just uh, listen to that on the down low. I won't tell anybody. Uh, hop into the comment section. Let me know what you think about everything that I've said here. Uh, answer the questions yourselves if you'd like. I'd love to hear some differing perspectives. And then I would love it if you shared the podcast. Tell everybody they should be listening to and watching the Locked On NBA, Locked On Celtics podcast. <laughs> Here on the Locked On Podcast Network, it's your team every day.